Welcome to Business Talk right here on businesstech.co.za and uh, time to talk about the word automation. And you might think we talk about automation, robots taking over and self-driving cars refusing to stop at yellow lights or printers that finally fix themselves. But today we're not diving into dystopia. We're talking about real automation, the kind that doesn't break your infrastructure while you sleep or send your DevOps uh, team into therapy. Joining me is someone who speaks fluent YML uh, without flinching, I'm sure. Carl Fisher is uh, the Chief Technology Officer uh, of at Obsidian Systems, a company that's been helping South African businesses stop crawling and start sprinting when it comes to infrastructure management. And today's topic, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Ansible for the growing automator, from crawling to running across your entire infrastructure, a bit like potty training for your servers. So let's get into it before the bots uh, break into the studio. Carl, uh, let's kick off with a bit of context. Welcome. You've been with Obsidian Systems for a while now. Tell us about your journey there and what drew you into this uh, blend of kind of open source automation and chaos management? Well, my my journey with Obsidian started when I was 18 in 1999. I, I wanted to join the company then. Um, I have now been with the company for over 13 years. So uh, I am uh, currently fulfilling the role of CTO. Uh, I'm having a lots of fun. Uh, open source has been a real passion for me and, and the way that things work and should be open for me. So I feel, yeah, I love it. Do you remember your first real kind of automation moment? What was the problem and what did your solution look like back then? I think I think everybody would just wants stuff to work, right? And back in the day, things on the necessary didn't work, right? So screens didn't work as they were supposed to. Then just writing a little script to just go and figure out how to do a screen alignment or a resolution setting or something like that. And, and that just yeah, gives you the ability to just scale yeah, they just work from there, you know. Now, and I know a lot of people in tech love to debate tools, but in your experience, how much do the tools actually matter versus the principles or the philosophy behind automation? I I think I think tools matter, but not in the ways that you think. I think for me, the important thing today is about making sure that whatever you build should be open and extendable in the future, not lock yourself into a specific. Uh, vendor or a specific way of work. So tooling is important, but I think extendability and making sure that you future proof yourself is a is a better, better, better idea, you know. Yeah. And I think future proofing is something that if you're not doing, your competitors are. And so you have that um, that t- technological debt that you incur as well. Now, you use a metaphor from crawling to running to describe the automation journey. Take us through why you're framing it this way and and what does it help teams or decision makers understand better around this journey of automation? I think I think usually when we, we speak to customers about automation, they the first thing that they want to do is do the most audacious, biggest goal that they have. And usually that is a great it's a great idea, it's great to walk to work to something towards that. But the problem is that you obviously need to crawl before you can walk. And so we encourage people to start small, just little things, just to to um, just ease day-to-day operations and make sure that things are just running smoothly, like adding a user to a system or something like that, something basic. And before you start automating a very complicated application. Um, so uh, using that metaphor is just, yeah, it just scales naturally. So the more adept you get at building the little things, uh, the biggest, uh, it just scales. And we are seeing it scale massively. I think automation is growing a lot more ambitious. Um, you're talking about multi-cloud, hybrid edge, containerized, uh, coffee machine connected environments. I mean, we, we really are almost automating everything inside. What are the biggest challenges that teams face in making automation stick if they're moving from a, peri- a stage of just crawling, starting out with it to, to becoming more advanced? I think the biggest problem that people have is that they are not very open to sharing what they find in their organization. So sometimes when they... W- come across some challenges uh, there's a sometimes a culture of like it's mine and you don't want that culture in an organization 
uh, you want to build your little island, you want to stay on the island, you want to keep yourself safe, you keep your jump safe. So we, we encourage people to be open with their findings because I think that reinforces a lot of the behaviors in our organization. Uh, also, it's important to try and determine exactly what you want to try and, and uh, automate, you know. Uh, there's there's little things that can be automated and there is big things that will take longer to automate. So when you start with that, start with the end in mind. So how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time, you know? So can I take a big complex task, break it down into little executable pieces, um, make it a, using something like a lean methodology? And then obviously when you start breaking those big processes down into little pieces, it becomes very easy to automate. So because it becomes checklists or something like that, and then it's, you can work towards uh, automating that. And then obviously another important thing is measurement, right? So you try and say, obviously there should be some kind of improvement. Otherwise, why are you, why are you measuring? You need to measure, right? Um, and people in the business and corporate environments tend to see measurement as bad. I'm not fulfilling my OKRs or my KPAs, and I'm not checking the boxes. Um, and I think in this culture, people are are very we tend to like we feel that we fall short. But measurement's not bad. When you bake a cake, you measure the ingredients, you put the oven at a certain temperature, the cakes in the oven for a certain amount of time. Um, that helps us to make sure that things are consistent and that we can replicate things. So measurement's good. So obviously, you want to improve the process, so you want to reduce time to deployment and then obviously another important thing is sharing and that reinforces the culture so you need to share your findings um so it's just a very nice acronym you know comms clans you know. Uh, what is the acronym clans clans culture le- uh, lean automation measurement and sharing just remember Fantastic. that clans clans it's great right. uh, and inside that clam shell you'll have the oyster of whatever you're trying to achieve with your automation project. And often, I mean, if if we're talking about what we're trying to achieve with automation, it's making repeatable tasks, um, you know, obsolete to to a human that can now go and work on something maybe more productive or making something a lot shorter in terms of timeline as as a UX experience, as a customer, improving their client experience and ultimately adding value through the organization. But I get your point about the culture and, resistance to that uh, and I'm they're almost cultural antibodies when we try and introduce new things that go and attack anything new so how do you convince teams that investing the time in ansible or, or similar tools is worth it in the long run I think I think the benefits speak for themselves I think uh, when you have an engineer I, I remember I was I'll talk about the story when, when I speak to customers is that when I started at Obsidian to deploy a server and put it in a server rack and put it up and hook up the cables and everything, that process, installing the server and configuring the software took two to three days. And, and with using automation today, it's two or three seconds. And uh, it just shows you the amount of scale. We provision things in the cloud with a, with a few few commands and back in the day, like racking and stacking a server two days. And I think that that journey and just helps helps people understand that there's a real time saving to, to using things like automation. But it's also not to take away jobs. It's to enable you to focus on the real things, you know, the real important things that you have to do. Um, I don't think everybody wants to put out fires the whole time. And, and putting out a fire is pretty consistent. You know, there's a way of putting out a fire. Have to rescue the people first, obviously, before you're putting out the fire. But I think people need to um, to see how how they can improve their their organization by the different pieces of automation, and um, and that's why Ansible is such a great tool. It's open source; you can use it today. It works with anything, um, and yeah, I, I I would strongly encourage people to try it out. Yeah, I, I mean, security and consistency are often sold as the kind of key automation benefits. But can automation ever go wrong at scale? How do you manage that oops factor in, in highly orchestrated environments? I'm sure you must get that question quite often. Uh, yeah, there's there's this acronym where they say uh, it's from DevOps to FOPs, right? So you don't want to 
Like <laughs> the good for to say that, but but I think yeah, it's automation scale, right? So you wanna you wanna try and reduce your footprint. So obviously we encourage people to use uh, uh, something like test driven development, where they can say, okay, I'm testing against a little subset of machines, or I have an automation pipeline that's running specific things against a specific and a predictable place. Then obviously you have to graduate, right? So you have to put the nappy on the baby before it can, while it's crawling. Otherwise, anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, before you can walk and run, I, I uh, yeah, so or start gonna, small. It's going to mess all over the place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let, let, yeah. Let's talk about GitOps and Ansible working together. What, what's the magic combo here? And why should anyone still managing infrastructure manually be paying very close attention to this in particular? I think we don't want to be prescriptive or descriptive or we don't really want to tell people exactly what they should be doing. I think the the big thing about the tool is that you can use it in any situation. And I think um, you don't have to start off with the complicated things, like we mentioned previously. You have to start small and just scratch that kind of that little itch that you have and then work towards something where it's predictable and you can do things at scale. And uh, GitOps is a great pattern where people can basically manage their automation as source code and it makes it uh, visible. So you can see who's adding what features and how it's going to run against things. And there's a better, I would say it's better guardrails to do your automation. And uh, we just like having customers looking at patterns like that, that that reduces blame because we don't want an organization that just points fingers at people. Obviously, if something's wrong in the organization or something at that scale, you want to make sure that things don't happen again at that on that level. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So, what does good look like? I mean, when you're running now, you've moved through your crawling phase, you're running in your automation journey. Maybe you could just paint a picture of what a mature, healthy, and humming infrastructure automation setup looks like. I think I think the, um, how the organization could look at that to say it's a measure success is, is to say that we are doing the basic things and we're using automation for that. We're trying to attempt bigger things using automation. Uh, and the, it's easier to onboard engineers to do day-to-day -day operations because you just point them to the automation and say, here's a safe guardrails. This is how it works. This is how things are done on a day-to-day -day basis at the company. They just use this. And uh, I think that is, that's how you can guide, guide new engineers on that specific process. And then just lastly, for anyone listening, whether they're a lone sysadmin with five servers or a CIO juggling a zoo of platforms, what's the one lesson or principle you'd want them to walk away with today? I think nobody's an expert. I think that is, that is, that is, uh, except us. No, I'm joking, right? So uh, I think, I think the, 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 big, the big thing is that you have to start small to walk to work towards something that's bigger than this. And I think that CIOs need to remember they have to enable their teams. You, obviously, when you try and focus on the automation language, you try and reduce cognitive load. So if you have an automation language that only speaks to one type of platform, that's a problem. Try and choose an automation language like Ansible that can speak to the cloud, on-prem servers, network switches, uh, Windows machines, Linux machines, Mac machines, AIX, right? Try and reduce the cognitive load. So people in make that uh, cognitive investment in learning one thing that could do multiple things as opposed to little bits and pieces of, of knowledge that's tracked in silos. I think that makes so much sense in a world where, to my earlier point, you've got a zoo of systems. You want that ability to have interoperability and for, for one tool to be able to talk in multiple environments and on multiple systems as well. There you have it, Carl Fisher. Thank you very much. Very much the expert. Uh, I know you're very humble and self-deprecating, but uh, uh, Obsidian really are the experts when it comes to these kinds of things. CTO at Obsidian Systems here on Business Talk, uh, helping us uh, go from crawling to running across our infrastructure when it comes to automation here on Business Talk. Take care.